start with that. We ran out of time. We ran out of time. So <laughs> we had to find this extra time to share yeah. this with you. Extra time. <laughs> <laughs> that was not easy. Trust me. <laughs> Are we rolling? Yeah. OK. Nice. So we've talked about the hard question of consciousness, the ultimate challenging question for philosophers and scientists of, of all ages. And let's talk, these are beginning talks. There's, there's so much more that we need to, to learn and explore and understand in these realms, the, the most important things we can possibly apply our minds to. So the, se the second one, second to consciousness, is the question of what's called in philosophy the arrow of time. Why does time appear to move in one direction. And what are the, some of the phenomena that are experienced where it doesn't seem to go linearly, monotonically, like continuously in one direction? Where we have, for example, a miracle. Not, not a miracle in the sense of how miraculous existence and life are, which is totally miraculous, but in the sense of where we see a discontinuity in our experience of, of the linear change of, of matter and energy and consciousness in, in a sequential series of experiences in three-dimensional space, which we call time. Do you have an example of that? There was a case where uh, this was not a patient, and, and I haven't personally experienced a miracle that, of that nature, uh, but there's, a, there's historically a case where a woman lost an eye and then decades later, miraculously was healed and now had her, not, not through growth of the tissue, which would be certainly miraculous from a medical, from a scientific point of view, it's like, we don't see that, and therefore it's outside the range of our scope of understanding, of, of our modeling, our thinking. It's outside the box, like, no, we don't see that. Uh, so in this case, it was a whole eye. that was her eye at the appropriate age. It was not a younger eye. That, that came from the past to the present without aging as we possibly could model that might happen if it were to be through that light connection of consciousness that, that I've described how, how light, light has a photon on each end of its connection. It's a wormhole. It's a connection across dimensions of space and time, space and or time. So if I see you or I see a star, that light is light, a quantum of energy of light, a specific quantum, not just any quantum, a specific quantum of energy of light in that star that is now gone into an energy field that's non-local, that's distributed, that's potential, that could be anywhere. We don't know. From experience of time, we don't know. Looking back on it, we can see, oh, I see that one. Well, it could have been you know, 80 billion light years the other direction, right? Because if, if we model it as a sphere, that energy goes out in all directions in space. But you know, when we look at the quantum physics of it, photons really, and, and all subatomic particles, show behavior that's completely reversible in time without changing anything except uh, matter appears to be antimatter. That's a, a definition of, of antimatter that makes more sense than calling it antimatter. Anti, anti what? Anti time. It's, it's reverse time matter. Just as good as calling it antimatter. In fact, maybe better. The whole idea of, you know, antimatter, oh, it, oh boy, we can make it explode. We can make a weapon out of it and, and, you know, destroy life. We can make an antimatter bomb, right? It would be incredibly powerful. Oh, but where's all the antimatter? Well, they're looking for antimatter for an explosive doesn't exist in, in, in that way. And, and so in our modern physics, we look at the universe, we say, where's all the antimatter? Right? Everything's in balance. There's all this matter. There's the question, physics of, this huge question. Where's the missing antimatter? Where is it? So you know, in, in the model of the material framework, the substance, the, the, the hull of the ship of, of existence or creation, is these five different types of presence that we see called the quintessence. 
that are in approximately equal amounts, which means they're in a functional relationship. And not through any physics known formula of relationship, there's some kind of a, this is a living physiological system, like the five elements in Oriental medicine is, is a perfect image of that. It's a perfect understanding of that. Uh, so we can apply each of those different five presences to the different five elements and begin to see, oh, we have a very sophisticated model of what is that, that tells us what dark matter is, tells us what dark energy is. And just like, you know, our modern view sees creation as the Big Bang, it's a big explosion, it's the understanding. Well, man always understands, woman always understands, and children, by what we know. What, what, what experience do we have in an age of mechanical objects that do productive work for us, that, that, that express our will? We have an age of mechanical thinking. We have an age of materialism where we almost forget that the spirit exists. It's why we exist. It's the important thing. It's the coherent thing, the thing that transcends, that is alive beyond the life of the, the carbon copy. So the question of time is the, is the question of causality. It's the question of origin. It's, it's an ultimate question like consciousness. The conclusion in physics, among physicists, is that it appears the best we can describe the substrate of what is of existence is consciousness. We have, at, at the smallest part of space that we can measure, the Planck unit, and we see how much energy is there in that Planck unit compared to the energy in the matter. Ooh, we can make an atomic bomb. There's so much energy in matter. If you were to explode, you'd destroy the whole Earth, right? It's, it's, we're that powerful, but we're that coherent that we don't explode. I don't actually suspect that the universe was created out of explosion in the sense of disorder, but rather out of growth, out of production of order. order. Like when you look at dark energy, that is the energy that they think is expanding the universe from a gravitational point of view. That's a point of view devoid of the life functions. It's like a dead body has gravity, right? Your dead body, your body has gravity. Are you dead or alive? Well, I can't tell. It has about the same amount of gravity. The one study that looked at the difference came up with, you know, one, people usually quote 28 grams or something that was like an average or one of the cases. I actually have a, a paper that reviews all the data on that study and, and actually shows there was a varying amount of mass of the soul of, from one human to another. They all had mass. In every case, there was an instantaneous, I believe I have to look back at it, I think in every case there was an instantaneous loss of mass and I think all but one case, it's one way or the other. All, one of the cases had only one of the two phases, I believe, observed. You know? but, but in general, you can say that, that, that of that one study that's been done, that there was an instantaneous loss of mass from the body, not accountable, accountable for by breath or you know, uh, you know, bodily change in body functions. Or, so it was something left. So the detached became its own thing, which the, the only clear thing to model that as is, is the soul, it's the spirit. It's the, what is seeing when a person has an out-of-body experience and sees that dead body on the table, even though they may later re-enter it. Um, there, 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 there was some kind of very recent study I just saw, I have to look more at the, the details of it, but where, oh yeah, it was a Russian study uh, where they, they, they use this cage, uh, it's, it's like a, a vacuum chamber that's used in physics for, for experimentation, and they, were, and they would put different animals in there. They were taking high frequency photographs and they are seeing an image of the, the animal that, that leaves the body that's in the same, like a ghostly image, like a ghost, like a, if you see a human ghost, it's in a human form. Unless it's... It's still the shape of the cat, or... Yeah, yeah, or it may just be in a pure plasma form where it's not expressing that, that light, that visual effect, that light body. It's not, it's not emitting photons, 
we're not seeing that, but we might see just the interior energetics of, of a plasma sphere uh, with, with like a, a comet, okay, that's the head of the comet, and with the, the tail. And we talked about in an early se earlier session how that is the original image for spirit in the Chinese language. That's the, 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 the pictorial image that was later you know, codified into a pictogram where it's a, s a square rather than a circle and it you know, still has the dot in the center and it has the three wavy lines. Um, so there's those two aspects of something that's coherent within and of itself like a sphere of, or an ovoid shape egg shape, it can be spherical, it can be elongated. Uh, so uh, that would have the integrity to be attached at its gravitational center, which is what I model on the large scale as that's what we're looking at saying, there's a black hole there. Well, we, we, and black hole is an idea, just like dark energy is an idea and dark matter is an idea. But what's an experience? An experience is centering. As a spirit, I have experiences. I can experience my center. I can experience centering as, an, as a verb. I can center, if I center my conscious body and my heart, I can, I can do that, I can hold that center, and I can also reach out with my mind and, and, and experience and even expand the space, the spaciousness within my consciousness. I can, I can reach up behind me to space that I don't see with my physical eyes, but I can visualize, perhaps with the pineal as an eye. Uh, and not that we see it with the eye, but we see it using the eye. You know, the eye doesn't see. Like we talked about in the previous case on consciousness, a man with severed optic nerves was completely blind. But at the same time, he, I didn't mention this before, he could navigate around tables, chairs, he couldn't tell you what it was without feeling it. But because the severing was after some fibers, not fibers for seeing the visual picture, the image, right, the, the hologram of color and light, but another hologram, oh, navigational, like, like a bat sees with sonar. Well, this is through vision, but before, these are nerves, fibers that leave the optic nerve before it gets to the visual cortex. There's lots of interesting pattern, uh, connections there to, to the timing system. The hypothalamus, the, the, the pineal, uh, regulating the pituitary and the whole endocrine system for day-night cycles, our biggest cycle. But we have four-week, 28-day you know, hormonal lunar cycles, uh, so does the cosmos. We're adapted to that, we're entrained with that. We're part of it. Uh, so causation and time. We know that light goes in reverse time just as easily as in forward time. And the same with the rest of matter if we look at it, look at it on a small enough scale. Uh, so the foundation of things, time is not what we experience. We're experiencing movement, which is change, which we call time. But that's a perspective. Just like in, in the, the thought experiments of, of, of Einstein, of what if I'm riding on that photon, what would time look like? And the conclusion is there, there is no time for the photon. It's, it's here and there. It's actually bilocating at two different spaces and times because it went from that star to me and everything else was changing and it wasn't changing, but it was moving through a field of potential, field of possibilities to its future destination, its future calling. How did it get here? Well, the conclusion, of, again, of physics is it got here by being observed. It's here because I see it. Oh, well, what happens to causation in that? I'm, I'm causing, not the photon. But yet, you know, the, we live in a consensual world, a world, mm -hmm. collaborative world. You're seeing, I'm seeing. We're, we're co-creating. Why? Because we're creating each of us our own experience, and yet each of those experiences, like little spheres of plasma that have memory of where they've been and what they've seen, that's what we are, that, that are coherent, that don't go away with time, they're immortal. Uh, or if we look at the 
these spaces, these cellular spaces between all the galactic clusters. So our galaxy is part of a big cluster. There's lots of galaxies in the cluster. And they're organized on sheets, walls. And there's another wall. There's a space in between. There's no galaxies. And they say, that's where all the dark energy is. Oh. And that's what's growing. Oh, it's the dark energy that's growing. But isn't that the grace that's growing? There's always more than sufficient grace. Grace is an energy. Dark energy is an energy. It's an energy that, that transcends time. It comes from the future. It's what you know, what's, brings my eye together with that star. If I'm meant to see that star, there's some resonance that exists outside this linear dimension experience of time, just in the wholeness of causality, where anything is possible. And if, if, it, if that's how we define God, it's all possibilities that it, it exist of itself, the space of possibility, and that's a, an aware space, completely conscious space, and it's a cellular structure, fractally, all the way down, as far as we can see. And we could take faith that beyond where we can see, beyond where we can imagine. And how does that make you feel? <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it helps on a rough day. <laughs> it's, it's not the idea of, oh, there's, well, if God is the ultimate cause of everything, and if there's this predestination that yes, there's a purpose and there's there's an end to this madness, you know, we're, that actually there, it's wonderful. The collaboration is at all levels. Mm -hmm. It's we are the cells in God's body. This is the divine collaboration. This is God's presence. We, these, are, these are God's hands. This is God's heart. These are God's eyes to see. God's ears to hear. We are the witnesses for ourselves as those cells in one body. If we can understand that we're one, you know, then like maybe, you know, sisters who follow Mother Teresa can go and pick up that man who smells like death because he is dying. He's lying on the streets of Calcutta and he's an untouchable and nobody, you know, will even see him. We don't see him in that culture. That's our, such is our blindness. In every culture, mm. we have these blindnesses. Do we see the miracle that is existence, that, that each moment, how, what creates that new moment? It's completely fresh. There's no expiration date on, on time so far. Well, the theme that comes to mind is also the saying, history repeats itself. That's the fractal Perhaps. nature. Yeah. yeah. As above, so below, history repeats itself. If those, you know, will we'll suffer again if we don't learn from that. The, the, that's the sense of growth, the sense of grace that there is, we don't live in a dead world that's, that's burning down, which is all that, that modern physics, in, in all its knowledge, that's all the wisdom it has, is that, oh, the world is, is it going to die of heat death? Is it going to just run out of steam? It's, it's getting, you know, it's, things will get more dispersed and, and hotter, but more spread out, and so they're getting colder, so it just kind of fizzles out. Or is it, they're starting to be cyclic ideas again, periodically. Or cyclic ideas periodically. That's about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's some interesting cyclic models that are that are, are being looked at mathematically. Well, that's the interesting thing. Looking at you know progression of human consciousness. Okay, we're modeling different ways of perceiving what is. It doesn't change what is, except it does add a layer to it. This layer of of ideation. This layer of of, of human consciousness transcending the level of, of uh, consciousness that we can imagine in, in animals uh, of basically language is where I see us taking the giant leap. Uh, and we don't really know what's going on inside the heads, inside the minds. We might be able to measure what's going on in the heads of an animal. But it's more challenging. You know, there's beginning to be some research on communication. You know, certainly, uh, other primates, uh, dolphins, cetaceans. You know, these are some of them. The cetaceans, mammals with a much larger brain, brain than we have. Different modes of communication. That you know, whales can communicate hundreds of miles. Uh, you know, without maybe thousands of miles you know, under the water. Um, we don't know what those consciousnesses are like, just like we don't know what the consciousness of 
the earth is like, except that we're a cell in the earth, just as we're a cell in God's body. It's all, all God, all the way up and all the way down. Causality? Language? Yeah, language, language is, is, is exactly, language is within our consciousness, it's the ultimate model of time because it's constrained by time. We can do multiple movements at once, we can move our whole body, all the different parts all at the same time. But with language, we're constrained to a sound pattern that gives words, that gives these meaningful units we call words. And we build them into a structure that's a linear structure, that's syntax of a sentence. Mm -hmm. So that sentence, where, uh, in thinking about this topic, what came to me earlier today, is where we see that syntactical sentence structure at a subconscious level in the body, where we're, a we're now able to measure it, is through the electronics, through the meridians, that we'll see, uh, and through the light, the, 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 the photonic communication, uh, so electromagnetic communication.